I started with a little homemade sound system, but that came pretty much at the time when I started importing and exporting records to, you know, US, UK, and Canada. And then I moved on to, you know, at, at home, you know, engineer, you know, in a wooden house and started cutting dubs and then started playing around, becoming kind of a self-taught audio engineer. So you taught yourself and you um you started the studio in your mother's house, right? Yeah, at 81 and a half Church Street. Yeah, we had a home studio upstairs. That's how I kind of was a self-taught engineer and bought a dub cutting machine from Treasure Island, started cutting dubs. Then nearly everybody gave me their tapes to cut dubs because by importing and expo importing foreign records into Jamaica in those days, you know, we had what you call the soul sounds, the sanatone and the soul and the Geminis and the, you know, so I had access to them all, you know. So I imported the records they required and I bought, you know, financed local projects and exported records from Jamaica all over the world. So automatically I had that access which allowed me to say, you know, I'm kind of a an entrepreneur op opportunist. So I then evolved to say, look, I have all these sound system connections. Why don't I, you know, move on to providing some services to these sound systems who are not importers of soul records? So I started cutting dubs and creating specials and, you know, buying our own equipment. So we did crazy things and made many a sound killer sound and, you know, make, make Radigan kill a whole lot of people and all, you know, we had great fun. <laughs> Tell me your connection with Bunny Lee. Um... Bunny Lee was just a person, a record producer, you know, within my time and year and space. So in a nutshell, you know, I knew him and I knew him well. And I guess he appreciated me because, you know, just a little kid who is doing his thing. And he kind of, you know, have we had mutual respect for each other. Versus was not the idle type. He always has a youth doing something. But she was under my wing. She didn't come like my son. Ask him. But if you know Bonnelly, not everything he says is gospel. I had no mentors. I just kind of, I was one of the persons who knew exactly what I wanted to be. And I evolved to where I am today and constantly evolving. I I have, I live by certain rules and belief. And one of the rules were, uh, one of the rules are, anybody can do anything you and I are doing but you and I'll do it differently. And difference is what brings success or failure. So whenever I look at a project or a task, I look at, you know, yeah, how can I do this different? How can I make it unique? And that kind of thinking got us to a point where we, we did a lot of things differently and they worked. The rhythm tracks weren't your productions, right? No, 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 no. I In those days, we had a, an industry norm where, as we call it then, you beg somebody a cut of a rhythm, then you do what, you know, what you want to do. So, for example, all screaming target projects were rhythm from a whole lot of people. The first, first recording I did, I had a mountain. That was a rhythm from Errol Dunkley, Uwe Baby. And we had um, Daddy Uroy did the uh, I Are the Mountain. And actually how I got that rhythm is that Doing from my sound system days, I did my own little homemade sound system, King of the i fi and I swapped the amplifier in that. Um, I swapped the amplifier to Errol Dunkley for a cut of the rhythm because he had a record shop in West Kingston, and I just swapped it to him. So he, he used that amplifier in, a, in his shop, and that's how I got the rhythm, and that's where history began for me. That was, was that 72 or 73? Would have been early of the 70s. That's about pretty much one, two, because I came out of Kingston College at roughly 1970. So it would be a pretty much one, two. You might have better memory than I. At my age, I'm allowed to forget. <laughs> well, I'm asking that because all of the releases that I've seen said 73, but you've had releases prior to that. It would have been before 73. Yeah. But then what happened is that usually some stuff came out at a certain point. And it then became popular at another point and at the point where others knew of it, they kind of time stamped it, different people for different, you know, different um for their knowledge base, you know, but it would have been early. It was the first thing we did. 
I really want to get into Screaming Target. That's a good point. <laughs> of course, the obvious one was it, it was like the first major DJ album after Virgin Galore. Yes, yes. Okay. Also, the fact that it overshadowed all of the original vocal cuts. <laughs> I mean, Big, Big Youth was kind of the new kid on the block. And we had or have a love-hate relationship. And love was me, hate was him. I mean, Big Youth <laughs> loves nobody but himself. He speaks good of nobody but himself. And I would go as far as saying he's the worst artist I have ever recorded. And I'll tell you why. It's simple. <laughs> For about 40 years, Big Youth, the many interviews and talking that I stole his publishing on Screaming Target, I knew nothing about it. He has never came to me, said anything. And at a point when he got around to explaining it, I, I heard him. He went to a point and he made a comment, which I knew. To be quite honest, he has said it so much time over 40 years that I actually believed and wondering if, and if I really did it and didn't realize. So can you imagine a man eat you for 40 years and you don't know nothing about it, never faced you. So when I checked it out and I realized what the problem was, I went to his publisher and I says, hey, look here, this is what he thinks. I know nothing of it. Here's what it is. Here's what you need to do. And I was, and I solved it for him. And he has never come back and said, okay, thank you. Because I have another saying, you know, he who speaks ill of all except his own requires a cure. And that is one of the most and gracious human being I have known, Mandy Buchanan and Big Youth. And I say that anywhere because he had never backtracked to say I was wrong. The, the latest thing I heard of he saying about a couple of months ago that Screaming Target was produced by, uh, by both me and him. It's such rubbish. Uh -huh. But, you know, it, it, you get some licks in this business that, I mean, I have had a great and exceptional run and I have respect in many quarters, but you, you get some very bad licks. Though. I mean, two of them, for example, is you know, I heard Red Rat on a YouTube channel talking to somebody and saying, um, you know, when man like Gussie Clark was saying dance hall music was Boogie Yaga, I've never said that. If you look at my history, I've produced so many dance hall songs. I don't know why I did that. Then you have what? another old time DJ named Tanto Irene in New York. Gussie Clark, the man, they're pirates of the Caribbean. Never met the gentleman, never had nothing to do with him, and thank God I never did. So you have great moments, but those are the three worst bad spots that I have had for which, you know, I don't know why they came. And, you know, another of my saying is that, you see, in this reggae industry, Jamaican music industry, when you're not a failure, you automatically become a target. So I can understand my position. There I am. And I, I can live with it. I mean, he and I have no conversation on those matters. And I try to be very careful in every, any, and all I say, because I am aware of how our industry works. I mean, people get their 15 seconds of fame by many different means and measures. And it's just, it's part of the game and part of the journey. Yeah. Success is the greatest revenge. Oh you know? my God, man. <laughs> I, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I tell people I'm as good as usual because it could always be worse. So mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me and fears me because they can't prove anything to the contrary. And anything I say, and I'm, I'm one of the few people why Anybody can ask me anything, anytime, anywhere, you'll get the same answers and you're not getting an answer because this is what I think. You're getting the answer because this is the fact that I am aware. And if I'm wrong, I will say I am wrong. So I'm the guy you can ask anything, anytime, anywhere. And most importantly, you'll get educated answers. Uh, the other thing regarding Screaming Target was it was released both on Gussie and Jaguar. It quite likely would have come out on the dynamics because they were our local manufacturer and distributor. So I I don't remember li I never licensed it to them with for them to have on release anywhere. But in those days, crazy things that when you were young, upcoming, don't know a lot of stuff. But I, I don't dwell on them. So, you know, it passed. Maybe we could have run out a label one of the times when we were pressing and they used theirs or something. I don't even know. But I never licensed it to them. In any way that they could have, um, should have done what they did. Okay. But it, it's all good. And one was like an isolated stereo mix? Um, of what? Screaming Target, the song? Uh, or the, the album. The album. Yeah. I'm not sure. Basically, in those days, I mean, you got a stereo file from somebody and you did the vocals on it. And, you know, what, what I know is that at some point in time later on, I kind of did a remix and 
kind of separated some stuff and play around their little percussions and got it. So you might have run into a copy where, you know. What can you tell me about the presenting Iroy album? Well, Iroy was someone that I had a great connection with. He had this, as a Jamaica call it, bossy, you might call it show off, you know. He had this aura about him and he was extremely intelligent and his lyrics were totally different from everybody else. They were so put together, you know, lyrically, rhythmically. He, he was just a different kind of a cat. And I don't think anyone else in our industry, Jamaican music industry, was ever, you know, fluent and descriptive, you know, and animated as he was lyrically, I don't think. So he was a difference to me then and still is now. So this is how we got together. And, you know, I was just looking at what projects could do and I just moved from one to the other. And, you know, he was evolving at the time also. So we kind of just gel blended and we made history. And that one was also released uh, by Trojan as well. Yeah, same scenario, pretty much a year or two apart. So what was your relationship with Trojan? No relationship. I mean, Trojan was the go-to place in the UK if you want to get your records out. So I was young, did an album, you know, you know, go to England, this record company will license, you'll probably get 10,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds. So you hopped on the plane, you landed, you handed over your tape, you got the money, signed something you don't know much about. It was just the beginning of your journey. So, I mean, no relationship beyond just, just a, a source. When you started actually producing the rhythm tracks, what studios did you use? We use them all. Randy's, Dynamics, Tough Gong. I mean, it was Federal Studios then. Tough Gong, Harry G, Music Mountain. I mean, I was actually, as an engineer working at also King Tubbies because, you know, they liked what I did and they asked me to come around and, you know, I recorded stuff, mixed stuff, even when we were cutting dub, Channel One called me in to see, you know, I could do what I was doing on the dubs in the studio and, so we use all the studios available in those days. Because one other thing, again, for me, that was a difference. You, you did different things in different places. You don't have everything end up sounding the same, excepting for the analog effect. So I use them all. Sometimes it was a matter of availability too. Usually I pick and approve all songs because one of the things of me, I am not one of the producers you will hear any artist honestly says, Oh, and when we were voicing it, Gussie wasn't there when we were laying the rhythm. I am hands on, I am involved 100% in anything I do. So I kind of, I'm a creature of that era of music, you know, the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s of soul ballad, you know, R&B, US songs. So I just loved those songs. It was such a, a good song for me and I just liked it and we just recorded it. So I chose the songs I felt that I liked and we could have reggae versions of it. And I had a very good relationship with most artists. Then we were all kind of budding and evolving. So, you know, the rest was history. All right, Dennis and I, we kind of, you know, came from downtown. And, um, you know, the, the thing with me, I, I have an idea of who I think of a certain kind of, certain kind of, not just talent, but a certain kind of talent and I have very good relationship with persons of a certain spirituality and certain persona and personality and the manure. And then it's just one of the most, then it's one of the nicest human being you could ever have known. He was so nice that he was destructive to his own self. You understand? He does know how to say no. I mean, then it's brown here and have a watch on and somebody say, well, they beg you this and they're taking it off his hand and him just give it to them. He was one of the most, as I tell you, one of the nicest human beings you could ever know, you know. I mean, I was even recording multiple projects with Dennis. And um, I remember one of the time when we were at Slypod and we were doing an album. I think it probably was uh, the one with uh, Dennis and Gregory. And I mean, I had to have a policeman sit outside there to keep people from coming in the studio to Dennis because I just don't know what to say no. So I literally had to give him a bodyguard during the recording process for us to, you know, I've gotten all the creative stuff we wanted out of him, you know. But he was, he was, he's humble, he's decent, he's, you, he's somebody you cannot eat, you cannot vex with Dennis Brown. 
And if you hear many stories about them, it's always about is per, you, you probably hear so much more about than is from persons who are deep in the industry, more about his personality than his talent as a singer. When I started originally, right, and, and let me tell you how I got to like a Greg Renault. Greg was self-producing himself, and he had his African Museum label. He also lived in West Kingston. So what happened is that um, I will go buy his productions from him to export. So we, we had that connection. So I usually ride up and go, dear Mr. Isaacs, and can I get 500 of this, 200 of that? And he was also, Greg Isaac is the most quick-witted human being I have ever met in my whole life. So he would always have, and was, he was an official. He was an original road boy also. So, you know, so, I mean, and he and I just got, al got along so well, you know, extremely well. And this is how I got, you know, even rhythms from him to have used in, um, on the Screaming Target project too. So, yeah, because some of those were African Museum productions. Yes, yeah. originally African Museum. I think in their own way it was one. Um, and one of these fine days might have been another where he sung. And I think there might have been one or two more. But, I mean, he was, he was just a great guy. Mm -hmm. Had his demons, but we all do. We were doing an album with Greg Isaac. I think it's called, um, oh, God. I think it, it's, it, was, it was titled two different titles. I don't remember what it named. And Greg was supposed to come to the studio for us to go do some pictures, you know? So Greg Reza came and turned up and um, I says, you know, we're here to do the pictures. And Greg said, uh, I don't remember funnily what he said, but the bottom line, he was unavailable to take the picture. And just call it stand out or miss. I don't remember what the name is. It's right. called um, Absent. Absent. Ah, see? Yeah. Tell you, I'm allowed to forget Absent <laughs> because he was actually absent from taking the picture. So I just basically took it without him, you know. So, I mean, he was great. I mean, Greg Isaac, one day we were at Dynamic Sounds and we were recording Private Beach Party album. And Greg, we came in this, two, two things up in the day. He was doing a song, it's called Nick of Time. And I'm saying, like, Gregory, why name Nick of Time? He said, me just make it up like Nick of Time. I'm like, okay. Then he said to me, Gossi, come here. Just, just follow me. Anything me, I said, don't pay it no mind. So he grabbed me in the collar and pulling me up to the gate at Dynamics. It was a good walk. And when Gregory reached up, he said, see you tomorrow. He had a cab waiting for him. So all those persons, followers, who we had down the bottom waiting for him to see me, give him some money to get some. He just slipped the whole of them and gone. You know? <laughs> so he was, he was, I mean, he was my friend. You know? He was my friend. You know, surprisingly, me, per, my personal choices are usually songs that are not all that successful because I, I have different personal. I, we, I have learned to separate personal and professional. And one of the songs I respect the most and put a whole lot of work into is um, I'm proud of what I did. We have a song called Get Well Soon. It might be on the CD you showed me. Yes. I mean... I mean, how many persons in Jamaica can say they have recorded a bunny wheel and all those persons who are on it? And if you look at the concept of the song, it was designed, hopefully, if it takes off, you know, this is something somebody wants, send somebody to say, you're down and out, get well soon. And it's probably the first reggae recording that has ever had so many artists together on it in one go, you know? And then I think on Private Beach Party, I think we did our IOU. We did a a version of Night Nurse where we had, you know, Pam Hall and other ladies come in and sing specific parts. And, you know, I, I kind of love those two. Financial reward was not the thing for me. It's the kind of production that I did and the difference and creativity that I put into a project. That's what gave me a little buzz and made me feel like, you know, okay, this is a good one. That's one thing, too, when it comes to, like, collaboration and stuff. With, if you're to put more than one artist on a track, one thing that I notice is that it can't be done all the time because there's no. a lot more misses than there are hits when it comes to, and not literal yeah. hits. I mean, like if the song is really kicking. Yeah. You know? Well, when I started doing all of that stuff, I looked at it differently. I looked at it to say, 
Gregory Isaac, Dennis Brown, and Freddie McGregor. These are all superstars and going to be super superstars. They're going to be performing on the same shows. So let me do stuff with them that they can, you know, do a call each other on stage and can close off a show with it. So it was definitely a concept with those specific aspects in mind. It wasn't just simply to get them to sing it together. It, it went beyond that in my reasoning then. Yeah, going back to Get Well Soon. Uh, that was a song that really took me by surprise when I was going through the anthology. And I was surprised that I never heard of it before. You know, it was a, it came out originally on the last album we did, the Mighty Diamonds. That didn't do so well. It's called Stand Out. When I send you a package, that's where it first was released on that album. It never came out as a single. So because the album didn't do as well as we thought, because equally like Mighty Diamonds was my favorite group of all time, but you know there was problem and challenges and different personalities and things. So we probably work on a project for all five years, you know, but we got it done. So that's the album it came out and why it was not so popular. And then I start, I, you know, put it on compilations to so say, let's give it a little bit of life. There was like about three different recordings of it, a slow jam, a reggae version, a, a cappella version. I don't know, but I don't remember how many different recordings of it is on the CD you have. Yeah, the, the only one that I have was the uh, the one with, uh, you know, See, Diamonds, Bunny and... No, all of them, all of them. You, oh, you mean the Mighty Diamonds by themselves? Uh, no, no. It, oh, no. it, it, the, the one off of the end. Okay, got it. Yeah. Well, all of them are the same vocals, you know, so we just did different mixes. And if you go back and look historically, I am I am probably the only Jamaican record producer was and now is still doing remixes of his own song himself at different points in time. If you go back and you look at to the foundation and funny feelings, the amount of times we have re-recorded and made so much different versions of it because we just felt it's a great song. It can be rejuvenated, it can be, you know, updated for the times. And, you know, that was just my way of doing things differently again. Yeah. Another one was uh, In Their Own Way by Dennis Brown. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's another one we did a couple of re-recordings -re of. It was kind of like my way. I just believe that, you know, I can update. And at a certain point in certain era, we actually do things a way. Like, for example, Showcase Eight, which was a rumors with him. I, I'm not into the rhythm thing, but we did it because we know we made a technological jump ahead of a crowd. And we know that in those years, it was so competitive. Everybody loved do over what the other person do. So we just did quite a few of them to be ahead of them and beat them to it. And nobody made anything that made sense. So we it worked for us. 